Welcome to the Hard Won Wisdom Podcast with best-selling author Vaughn Germer and corporate innovator Michelle Brigman. Come here weekly for career and life-changing conversations with some of today's most influential thought leaders, senior executives, and trailblazers who will share their mentoring wisdom. This podcast is brought to you by the Women's Leadership Network. Hi, I'm Fawn Germer. And I'm Michelle Brigman. And this is the Hard Won Wisdom Podcast. This is season our, finale. Season finale. It's like this is your cliffhanger for what's coming in the future. But how exciting this is for us. We've recorded 21 podcasts now. You all haven't heard all of them yet, but we started not knowing anything about what we were doing. We were we were really fumbling around in the dark. The low point was when we had one and I forgot to hit the record button. I wish I would have had a picture of your face when yeah. you realized that you did well, not record that bond. It was priceless. Yeah, but the thing is I get that look on my face about twice a week. So it's not that unusual. <laughs> but to all of you who've been following us, what a ride this has been. And we are so grateful for all of your support. We have had so much fun. This has been such a growth year for both of us. We started this, you know, I had the idea. I had a book come out last January and was talking to Michelle and then poof, we were going to do a podcast and started coming up with what we wanted to do for the format and not anticipating any of the personal challenges that we were going to have at the same time. On my end, I was in a cycling accident that left me with a head injury that took quite a while to get through. And I'm still not through it. I've got some memory issues, but that rendered me unable to work for a number of months. And that totally stopped everything on this. But Michelle wasn't too upset when I was like, oh, we can't do this right now because I had, this is like been the hardest over a decade. Honestly, it's been over a decade that I have had so many struggles in my personal life. And so it was kind of a, it was kind of a shit show. Well, there you go. Can I say it like that? No. but, But thank goodness. I mean, I think it was a great testament to just us being able to work together and acknowledging that, you know what, this is, we're going to make it through, but we've got to, we've got to like slow the roll a little bit. And fortunately you had the foresight to say, we're not even getting started until we have 12 episodes in the can. So we were never under pressure. And that was, it's like, you were, you were like a fortune teller, a psychic whenever you made that decision. And people, this also is a testament to one of my mantras. And I always have trouble figuring out how to say this on stage. And since Michelle already said the word, I want to say it because you go through life and you learn certain things at different stages. And at some point I learned that Every shitstorm ends, no matter what you're going through. Yes. At some point, it ends. So all you have to do is keep moving, which is what we really tried to do. And we're both dealing with some of this stuff still, but I think we're in a pretty good place. I think we're great. I feel like I feel like on one hand, right, there's been a lot of challenges, but on the other hand, there's been all these amazing things that have happened over this past year as we've you know, really kind of leaned into what this podcast stood for, learned a lot about ourselves. And it's just been a phenomenal experience. It hasn't been easy, but it's been phenomenal. And it's been work and it's business, but also out of it came the greatest friendship. It's just, it is so much fun. We just got back. Michelle flew down to Florida and we went to the Keys with Brooke Whipple, who was on our podcast. She's kind of a survivalist and just this great outdoors woman. And we had such a good time. Gosh, what fun that was. So yeah, but let's just think about this. You had Brooke, the survivalist, and then you had Michelle who has never slept in a tent. I'm outdoorsy, but I didn't sleep in a tent my whole life. And then you have Vaughn who, uh, she runs, she leans more, not quite survivalist, but she's definitely further on that side than, uh, then closer to me because uh, she she lives for camping. So I bet Brooke was thinking, "What in the world but, have I got?" It myself just goes to show sure. you build your own village. So people always say yes in life, even <laughs> if something sounds like it's not what you're used to. Because 
there is no recreating how much we laughed and how much fun we had. But anyhow, we do have a purpose for being here today. And I thought it would be really cool if we went through some of the people that we've met this year and just talked about how they impacted us and what we learned from their hard-won wisdom. And that was really why we wanted to do this. We wanted a women's leadership podcast. And this first season focused heavily on historic women. Many of these women were firsts. So they're first to do something and had many times been out there in their discomfort zone. So that was, that was really uh, fulfilling for me to get to talk to some of these people and hear their stories and how they brought it together. And I, I, I was glad that you thought the same as me, that we needed to start with Stacey Allison because she was the first American woman to summit Mount Everest. But I really loved the way she told her story. And if you didn't hear that podcast, it will inspire you unbelievably because her story is not just about climbing the tallest mountain in the world. It's about facing every obstacle that you face at work and in life. And what it takes to keep going when you can't go any further. It's it's just a beautiful story from a really powerful soul. And, um, you know, some of the quotes were just unforgettable. And I'm glad we've got some of those picked for you. So let's take a second so you can hear Stacey Allison. Yeah, so originally when I decided to climb Mount Everest, I was standing on a, a smaller peak in the Himalayas on a, we were actually an all women's expedition and the first women to stand on top of Amit Blom. And when I stood on top, I could see Mount Everest. It was about 40 miles away and it was another 6,500 feet above us. And it was at that moment that I said, I want to climb that mountain. And I wanted to simply know what it would be like. Am I um, strong enough physically, mentally, emotionally? Um, what would it be like to stand on top of the highest peak in the world? And so that was my inspiration. Um, but what happened is that three months before I went on that first climb, I went through a terrible divorce. And I thought, if, if I'm the first American woman to climb this mountain, I'm gonna show the world I'm somebody. And I'm gonna show my ex-husband I'm somebody. Um, but that didn't work. What happened on the climb is that um, I didn't care who I stepped on. I didn't care how I got to the summit. I just had to be first. Um, when my teammates asked me to do something that benefited the team, but didn't necessarily benefit me personally, I didn't do it. I was only out for myself. Um, and I knew where I was every step of the way in relationship to everybody else on the climb, it was um, very restricting. And when I got back, the thing about failure, the beauty about it is you, well, first of all, you've got to take the time to reflect, but it, it offers us an opportunity to take a good hard look at ourselves. And when I got back from that first trip on Everest, I took a good hard look at myself and I quite frankly did not like what I saw. And I vowed the next time, if I had an opportunity to go back, things would be different. I would be a team player. And I had to remind myself that I don't climb mountains to get to the top. I don't step over people. I, I am a very supportive person. And um, I had to come to terms with, with how I acted on that climb. And, and the thing that I was reminded as well is that, um, when we help other people achieve their goals, we oftentimes achieve our goals in the process. So I really like that idea of how she draws together her eagerness to get to the top of the mountain and how she was willing to walk over people to get there. Because Michelle, I'm sure you've seen people at work. I certainly have people who are willing to just knock anybody out of the way because of their own ambition being so powerful. And few would ever articulate that and admit it. But the lesson she learned about how getting other people up there as a team and the power of that really is something that we all can learn from. Absolutely. I think that if I reflect back on my own career and what I've observed, I see so many young 
leaders making the mistake of their eyes are on the prize. And I don't even think it's always intentional, but the eyes on the prize and they sort of have blinders on and they forget about the other people and they forget about the ripple effect of their actions because they're looking to win. And also a lot of organizations promote and push you, you know, cross the finish line, be first, be first. So it's like, you don't even realize the ramifications of those actions. And I think that um, as you mature as a leader, you become more aware and you become more effective. And I think what Stacy did so well in her story was really showing the transformation and growth of eye on the prize, hungry for the win, and then recognizing how it's so much sweeter. Victory is so much sweeter whenever you're surrounded and you're helping others. Yeah. And as women, it used to be that we saw other women as the enemy because there was only one piece of the pie reserved for women. Now that's changed a lot, but there was this mentality that if you got ahead, it meant that I didn't. And so I had to do it first. And instead women are figuring out that we just have to get more pie for ourselves. And the way to do that is by celebrating other women, bringing them up, cheering them on so that they create more opportunity for those that are coming behind them. It doesn't matter who gets there first. It just matters that you get there. And that's what really is the top of the mountain is that moment inside of you when you realize, wow, look what we're doing as a sisterhood and how we're enjoying this. And and, and even with the brothers in this process, too, that there is a shared moment of success that is making the organization stronger and ourselves stronger. And I also love when Stacey talks about how we have to ante up for our success and that the moment comes when you really have to give it your all to get where you're going to go. And I know that I've had some experiences where it has required Herculean strength to just get through one particularly hard challenge. And she lays that out pretty, pretty articulately for the rest of us. So let's take a minute to listen to that. We can take this analogy back to business. Um, every time you're, um, you encounter a challenge, you have, it's time to ante up, right? Is this truly what I want to do? Am I in the um, right uh, organization? Am I doing the, the job that I, that I want to be doing? Um, when you're anteing up on a climb, you have to cross those ladders and they're, you know, they're swaying, they're bouncing. You know, you've got a hundred foot crevasse below you. You've got an ice tower above you. Um, and it's, it's time to ante up. I mean, if you don't see yourself reaching the top, you're not going to take the risk to, to cross the ladders. Why would you? So I hope you enjoyed that. What did you think? I, I mean, I think that she, like, I can't, it's hard to even put yourself in the position that she was in, in terms of what it took to climb that mountain. And it, I was so moved by the determination. And I know you have to, you have to think back of, okay, I know when there's been times whenever it was hard for me to see the top and I'd forget maybe what that goal looked like. So how do you keep yourself motivated to keep going? And like she said, just anting up and putting all of your, putting it all in. Um, She makes a very good comment about, it's all about the moment and the celebration and not about the, the, the logistics or the tactics of achievement. It's about the feeling you get when you have achieved. And I think that's what helps people remember um, how to give it that last final push or ante up in order to be successful and achieve their goals. It was just so powerful. I know. That's so another story that really touched us was that of Carl Brookins, who fled an abusive marriage with her four kids. And I really came to appreciate something she said about how she did something to bring her family together after all of this happened, it wasn't like they suddenly got to safety and they all were, were kumbaya, happy, let's do it, mom. They were in shreds and their project was to build a 3,500 square foot house with the help of YouTube videos. That, that's shocking that she could I even do that. Unbelievable. And, and yet, well, they're making a movie about her people. So that tells you how extraordinary she is. But I want to share a couple of 
sound bites from her first. Let's let's hear the Kara Brookins quote. You know, I knew that it was possible for me to get from this rock bottom place to a place where I, I could enjoy life, where my kids were happy, where we were a close family unit. I knew that was possible. And I knew that it wasn't going to happen by some kind of baby steps, because that's what everybody kept telling me. You know, you're having a tough time. Well, just keep taking baby steps and it's going to get better, sweetheart. No, it wasn't like just getting up every day and putting on my socks and making a pot of coffee and stepping out the door was not going to make it better. And I had this idea that I'm so far down that the only thing that's going to make this better, that's going to get us ahead is to do something extreme, that it's going to have to be some massive kind of a leap forward, not a baby step. And then from there, we're starting at like a, a new base level, you know, we've leveled up. So it's interesting how that project gave her some sort of control over a very out of control system a moment in her life, right? That she was trying to, to bring things together for her family to get her life to move it along. And this unbelievably hard challenge was what it took so that they could stay focused, have a common goal and take control back so that they could build a new life. They weren't just building a house. And that, that's beautiful. Well, you think about how often people find a place where they just hit rock bottom and it's deep, like that hole can be super, super deep. And um, I know she talks about not being able to take baby steps, right? To be able to have to do something huge like this house in order to, to save herself and her family. And I, I think, you know, most of our listeners, we've hit that moment where you're at a place and you're, you're just trying to, to muster up the strength to keep going. And I think that's exactly what she did is through her story of doing something bold, she will propel you forward in a way that you just may not have yet figured out that you're capable, capable of on, on your own. I mean, she hit me. I bawled like a baby. Like (laughs) I never expected, I never expected to be as touched by that story. Um, as I was, and it, it truly changed my heart. And, um, I'm so grateful that she said yes to spending time with us. That was just, it's been incredible. Well, this next clip, let's, let's hear this. And I had this thought that, you know, I know how to use most of the tools. I hadn't used all the tools, but I could cut a piece of wood. I could pound in a nail. And my idea when I started, and this was not correct, but my idea was, that building a house is just doing those things a whole bunch of times, you know, and and it kind of is in theory, uh, but it's a lot more complicated. And of course, from day one, out here on a muddy construction site, I bought an acre of land. From day one, I realized I'm in way over my head. I am gonna have to somehow create skills. I'm gonna have to figure out how to do things that are way beyond my skill set, beyond my physical ability. So I'm gonna have to modify the way that I do things. It's a two story house um, with a seven foot tall block foundation that we built ourselves with water we hauled from the neighbor's pond um, because I was the plumber. I was the plumber, I ran the gas lines, I did the sewer lines. And because it took me so long to figure out how to do some of those things, like hook my water line into the city main, we had to do things in a primitive way. I laid 1,500 concrete blocks hauling five gallon pails of water from the pond. Um, you know, it was, it was this overwhelming amount of work. But for the first time in my kids' lives, they had full control of something. There was so much power in that. Now, the reason I love this clip is it shows something that many of us have to learn, but never seem to give ourselves freedom to learn, which is that sometimes you're going to do things and you won't know everything, but you might know a little bit about it. And just this idea where she says that she knew that she could cut a piece of wood, she could pound a nail, And when she started and she says, my idea was building a house was just doing these things a whole bunch of times. And uh, there's no secret about all of these studies showing what happens when women are asked or are considering certain job opportunities. 
they feel like if they can't do every single thing on that requirement list, that they won't get the job and that they shouldn't apply. But I love how she's broken it down into the simplest thing, which she did something which was really in anybody's book, except hers, impossible to do. Build a house, hook up the sewer system, deal the deal with the electrical, all of this stuff. And she just knew she could do this little bit and this little bit. And it was just doing those little bits uh, over and over, over, and over and again over. that was going to leave her with a house. Well, and I think it hits on that whole imposter syndrome idea, right? Where right. women, That's, it's like, well, I'm not, I'm not that, therefore I'm going to disqualify myself before I ever get started. And my gosh, if her story isn't about going from a computer programmer to now she's all things construction and can create this incredible house, like, I mean, come on, that is, that is a, that will throw any idea of being, having imposter syndrome out the window. (laughs) You know, when you see that house, it's a beautiful home and I, I just think of the things that I'm afraid to even do in my home, because even though there is YouTube, I know I'm going to mess it up, <laughs> but think of the confidence it took for her to say, we can do this as a team. And when you start to feel a lack of confidence, when it comes to doing something you're not comfortable with, think of her because if she I could build change- that house, you what? I said, I had to change the water filter in my refrigerator the other day on this true story. And I'm looking it up on YouTube and I'm sitting there thinking about um, her story. And I'm not going to lie. I put it in and it leaked all over my, Ah, I didn't do it right. But I mean, it was like the stinking water filter. Like, and then, so it was just such an appreciation for how many of those little things that screwed up that she could have said, oh, to hell with it. Like, forget it. And she didn't, she didn't, she kept going and she right. her and her family pulled together to make it happen. And I'm like, even more so, I'm just, just, it's amazing and inspiring story. Well, I am ashamed to admit the things that I hire people to fix for me, but I do because I think uh, I'll probably mess that up. And so I've got to ground myself in Kara's story a little more so that I remember I can do that. And I think Michelle knows this in the back of my mind. I really want to do a van conversion, but I keep thinking, oh, I'm going to mess that up. But she built a house. How hard could it be to fix a van up so that I can use it? Right. Do it. You're going to do it. I'm going to have my audience cheer me into that. Okay. Kim Nelson. So Kim Nelson is just this legendary corporate superstar. She's going to be in our New Year's uh, Women's Leadership Network event on how to reset, reboot restart your life and for 2022 and she was one of the presidents of general mills and snacks division and is on the board of colgate palm and she's just a total trailblazer and good person because i have watched her be kind to others who need help so i just really love her and i had interviewed her several years ago and i wanted to come back to this idea she had about how motherhood was what really trained her to be a great leader. So let's hear some words from Kim Nelson. I will. And I just have to say, Fawn was the first person I really knew that kind of drew me into the book writing process. Like when you did your uh, new power rules book and asked me to be a part of that, that was the first time I really got kind of close into someone's process. And I, I, anyway, very inspiring. So thank you for that. You've got big things in front of you. (laughs) Wear that nice suit. Look great. All right. So this book, um, I have the chapter headings done. And one of them is mommy, I'm afraid of the dark. And that's all about risk taking and the fear of the things that are unknown that you can, that can paralyze you. And sometimes you just need someone to come show you that there's nothing under the bed, there's nothing in the closet, you're fine, go for it. So that's one. Um, Another chapter head is no me mommy. So any mother knows that, no me, I I wanna do it. And that's all about how your employees wanna do it. They they know you know how to do it. They don't want you to do it, they wanna do it. And what they really want is another chapter head called look mommy. And look, mommy is just, all they want is your praise. 
That's all they're asking for. Just just look at this and and this brilliance and admire it and tell me how beautifully I've drawn this picture. And so many times we don't do that. Instead, we say, but you know, why did why is it blue? You know, horses aren't blue, you know. And that's the same thing for your employees. Your employees really a lot of times just need for you to say, great job. That is really well done. I just have to tell you that was so beautifully done. So there are just, there are all these little insights. I've always said that the best professional development program I've experienced was becoming a mother, for sure. Patience, um, empathy, uh, learning how to teach, how to coach, um, but not do. Uh, all the things that uh, any, any good leadership uh, training program will tell you, uh, your kids will teach you. Vision, you know, telling, helping them understand what's going to happen, where we're going, all of that so that they, they're like, okay, I understand what we're doing. Um, I remember my, my eldest Sam would always say, where are we going? Who's going to be there? You know, why are we going there? She always wanted to know what the plan was. And it's like, you know, you're four, what do you, you don't even know any of the people that will be there, but she wanted to know. So, and I think that's how employees can be too. You know, even though they're operating in this small little place over there, they wanna know what, where are we going? What are we trying to accomplish here? I understand I have a small piece here. How does my small piece fit into the big piece? So I think there's a lot, lot there. Okay, so. I've always told her there's a bestseller in this, but I'm, I'm waiting for her to write that book. Sis, what do you think, mama? Oh my gosh. I, well, it completely, honestly, she brought a whole different perspective to leadership. I, you know, I think about so many, so many women who are trying to figure out what does it take to transition in from maybe an individual contributor to a leader or a leader and, you know, good leader into a great leader. And yes, if you've had kids, you can relate to all of these lessons. And honestly, if you haven't had your own kids and you've ever had any type of caretaking responsibility for them, these, the lessons she shares are hundred percent true. We all are trying to satisfy, I think our little inner child about pay attention, value me, teach me, guide me, congratulate me. Just, it's just a matter of a human nature of um, just appreciating people. And she breaks it down to where if you are starting out and trying to figure it out, you need to listen because Kim will give you the secrets to success with leadership. And I really like that because there are a lot of people who, you know, come up with all these complicated leadership mm -hmm. theories. And over the years, I've done so many interviews with well-known leaders. And one theme has come back again and again and again. And it's that leadership starts and ends with the golden rule, which is treat others like you want to be treated, do unto others. And there's a version of that in every faith, every faith. And in its simplest form, it really is like parenting, right? It's treating people in ways that show them how they are valued. So I, I, I love that quote from Kim. And I, I think there's a lot to be learned from that woman keep pounding at her to get the, please do it. The book. Yeah. Do it. Beat her down. Come on, wear her down fawn. I'm okay. counting on you. Cause I'm ready to buy it. Now, Brooke Whipple. Now you all know, since we went camping with her, we now know her very well, but I found Brooke Whipple on YouTube because I'm single. And the thing I know about spending time in the evening, cause I'm not working out or, or doing things is that I have a YouTube addiction and I go in these little rabbit holes. Like I have to know the history of ABBA or the Bee Gees or, you know, and I'll, I'll go into these rabbit holes and I find a lot of people who love the outdoors like I do. And I found Brooke who was on that show alone. And so she knows survival skills, but also off-grid living and, and builds cabins out there and everything. And I just was kind of taken by her. I just thought this person has a lot of really good energy that I think the audience can relate to and can learn from. And Michelle's like, yeah, let's get her. So we get her. And 
her story is amazing. You, you really want to hear that whole podcast when she talks about how she, with $200 in her pocket, she moves to Alaska and starts her life. She's fearless. You know, I mean, this is a woman who hangs out with bears carefully, right? But she's, she's fearless like that in a way that most of us are not. And I, I liked some of these quotes from her session you know, one that I really like is about how she has developed campsites and cabins right on her own property because she's got responsibilities that right now are keeping her close to home. She's got a mom and assisted living, and she's got some reasons that she needs to be closer to home instead of at her properties up in the Upper Peninsula or out in Alaska. So she's in in Michigan, Central Michigan, for that, and. I tease her. I, I get her city name wrong. So we'll just say she lives in Pierce, Michigan, but not really. Anyhow, so she's she's talking about that kind of resilience she finds out there on her own property. And let's just hear a few words from Brooke right now. If you would have told me where I'd be at right now in my life, doing all of the things I love, which like right now at home, um, because I'm not traveling to all of my exotic fun locations, which are the remote wilderness locations, because my daughter just graduated. I have a mom in assisted living, so I can't get away as much as I'd like to anymore. Um, sometimes there's things that hold me back, but home, home, my homeland, like I can still do something there and have that sense of being outside and that adventure. So right now I'm making this like secret campsite on my property because I have found this grass that's like eight feet tall and then I found these vines on the edge of the forest and I found these awesome like downed logs and all I could think of is like I need to camp here and so like I'm making this campsite fairy tale campsite in my backyard area just because I want to and, and I film it and I get paid to do that and like Nothing can stop me from doing that. It's that's like my job. You know, I'm thinking about building a cabin here in a month or so. And so by yourself. Yeah. And so I just have all of these things that I can do. I feel like this is how I live my life. Like I'm an adult and I make forts in the woods and I get paid. <laughs> so don't you just love how she's like, oh, I think I'm gonna build a cabin in a month or so. And then she built it. She does it by herself, she does it. Yeah. And I, I, and I also just love, like you said, she's fearless. She's going to figure it out. She's so creative with all of her ideas. And, you know, it's, I think that's the beauty too, of the, the passion that she's put herself into is the fact that she's like, I have a love for this. I'm interested and I'm just going to create, and she's not doing it to satisfy anybody else's expectations. It's about the feeling and joy it brings her. And I think there's a lot to also learn from that mentality of it's not about winning the awards. It's about doing the things you love. And she is also so committed to her family and how much they're doing that's, together. And I think that was also a really cool balance to hear from her. That's, you know, what I was going to say is that her YouTube channel is called Girl in the Woods. So you think of her more as a solo person, but the more you hear her story, She's not. She's with her family all of the time, except these respites when she's doing the things for her channel and just totally devoted to her family, finds a way to do what she loves individually, but and, and, and you know, doing the things to be independent, but also to be a very active wife and, mm -hmm. and mother. She's just and that's what I thought was super, that's what I thought was super cool. And then her passion and commitment and love that she has for her followers and the relationship she builds, you know, you in business, right? It's the, it's that human fa factor. It can be the people on your team. It can be your customers, but how do you really connect with and yeah. listen and build and develop meaningful relationships? And I think she's just a very good example of being able to do all those things, be great at what she does and follow her passion. She's got it all. Yeah. And that second clip gets at something that I've been harping on with women for so long, because so many times people admit to me, they feel like they need to ask permission to do what they really want with their lives. And I always say, okay, I give you permission, just do it. And she talks about that need that we have for permission. So let's, let's roll that clip. 
I hear every day in my comments from people and emails and messages that they want to do this. Like they've suddenly had a light bulb come on and feel like they've missed out on parts of their life. And now they want to go for it and live. And I, I always feel like I want to give them permission to do it. And like, they need that permission. Women especially sometimes need that permission to kind of be a little more independent, um, especially a married woman. Um, and it's respectful to your spouse, of course. Um, there is a fine line, but also uh, you need to step out of the shadow a little bit and, and gain that independence by doing something. And sometimes it feels a little radical if you've lived in a box a long time of your life. And so, yeah, you need, you need that permission to go, yeah, you know, you're stronger than you think. You're smarter than you think. You can do way more than you think. And nothing teaches you more, more than that than starving on an island for <laughs> seven <laughs> weeks. But, you know, your everyday needs are pretty basic. And beyond that, you can do so much more than you think you can. You're capable of so much. So, Michelle, do you feel the need for permission? Oh, I struggle with this all the time from my really? kids, from my husband, you know, from my, from all of it. Yes. It's been a lifelong thing. And so it's very liberating and it's not easy. I'm learning, but she had some really great advice. And it's interesting as I talk to other women like you, um, I find myself oftentimes saying I need to give them permission as well. So I think that that's an area where we can help one another. We as women can help one another. And I also think for the men listening here, it's something to be aware of because I think that you yield a lot of influence over women feeling like they're free of independent, autonomous, uh, not stepping away, not pushing people away, but that's a really a great way to help them thrive. There's an episode and we're not going to play a, a quote from it, but I think it was pretty important when it, we talked about the whole issue of mom guilt. And they had this fabulous guest, Joanne Lublin, who has written a book on that topic. And that is a driving force for so many women. And we're going to do a lot more with that in the coming months. But I do want to close with somebody who I just love. And it's Catherine Switzer. And Catherine was the first woman to officially run the Boston Marathon. And she didn't stop there. I mean, she kept running, but what she did was pave the way for other women to be great athletes and, and doing so much for others. It hasn't stopped. And then ran Boston again, the year that she turned 70. I love her story because when they realized that there was a woman out there on that course, the race director tried to yank her off the course. And there was a photographer that captured that whole scene of this guy trying to yank her off the course. And then Catherine's then boyfriend, this big burly guy, just trying to push him away so that she can keep running, which she did. And she finished. And at that moment, that guy became a symbol of all the sexism that women are facing because there's always someone trying to pull them off the course. But what I thought was so interesting was the healing that came with him after that. And, and this quote from her talking about how they came together as friends after that. So let's roll that quote. The, the issue became up to, up to Heartbreak Hill Fawn, which is 21 miles. The issue became, I'm going to finish this race on my hands and my knees if I have to, to prove that women can do it. At, and then at 21 miles, I forgave Jock Semple. You, you can't run 21 miles. That's when you're on fumes, right? At that point, you got five to go and you're on fumes. Um, I forgave him. I said, he's a product of his time. It's going to be up to me now to, cr to create change. You know, and, and the last quote really talks about how far women have come in terms of supporting each other, because she had a lot of resistance from other women when she was being this superhero for all of us. You would think that she would be cheered on, but her going out there and doing that was actually threatening to many women. So let's play that quote. There weren't a lot of women who really were supporting me. 
And in fact, women were tougher on me than men were. And it wasn't just a queen bee syndrome. I mean, they were actually kind of afraid of me. Um, the only people who ever tried to run me off the road when I was training were women. Um, and I remember having this discussion with my coach. I said, why are they doing that? And he said, because they're afraid of you. And I said, why are they afraid of me? And he said, because you've got freedom and power they don't have. And I said, Arnie, all they have to do is put on their shoes. And he said, I know that, you know that, they don't yet know that. So Michelle, how does that hit you? Well, so it's fascinating to me because we, we still see it all the time. Like this is something that I observe constantly, even in um, corporate America, where the, the women are almost caustic in the relationship. And she continues in that story to even talk about how the men were actually more supportive of, wow, I wish my wife, I wish my girlfriend, I wish my sister right. would be out here doing this. And I thought it's really interesting. And I thought it was really insightful in terms of how often are we um, not acknowledging and celebrating the men who are lifting us up? And I think that's a lot that we can learn from just her story and just to see sort of the arc of that, that um, change in history. I mean, it was truly right. transformational, but I, you, I think culture in a company has a lot to do with it as well, because there are some companies that really are creating space for women to lift each other up. And I think that as a leader, you have to be so mindful as you progress what are you doing to extend a hand, teach them to fish, and again, and acknowledging the men that are there supporting the journey? Because it takes all of us, whether it's women or it, any, other, any other group, right? It's about how we are coming together for the good of everyone. I am so glad you said that because I have had some of the most amazing male supporters and mentors dating back to the beginning. Yeah. There, there's a man who, when I was in high school, hired me to be a reporter at the Bradenton High, uh, Herald. And I was 16 years old. And here we are more than a few years later, and we still get together for lunch. And just the gratitude I have for this man who years ago saw that a woman had talent to do something that not many women did and cheered me on and advised me. And, you know, he hired me later on in my career as well, you know, like 15 years later. And those people who are there for us, male or female, we need yes. to celebrate and we need to thank, and you all know that, but the men who do it and the men who did it, especially when it wasn't common, they, they need all the love in the world because they still had all the power. So they were sharing it when many others were threatened by that concept. So I love that you brought that up, Michelle. And I, I, I really, I think that lesson from Catherine is another strong one. We could go through every person that we interviewed and get so much more hard won wisdom. It's a beautiful thing. What we've, really is. what we've gotten from them, it's a million dollars worth of free therapy. And we're starting our next season out with, Oh my God, Trudy Bourgeois. Trudy. Oh my God, people. Going to blow your mind. She's amazing. She will leave you crying and powerful like Wonder Woman. And it just goes from there. So I just want to thank all of you who've been on this journey with us. We're just getting started. We've learned to turn on the recorder. We've learned to put the microphone in front of us. We've learned a lot. And the beauty of life is that if you're doing it right, you're never done learning. So we love to hear from you. If you have any suggestions, we hope that you have a wonderful holiday season and that 2022, my God, 2022, that for you, it is as empowering and uplifting as possible. These have been some challenging times, but for those who put on their blinders, and say, I will be happy and successful regardless. It has been a moment of limitless joy. We have challenges, but we can be fulfilled. So take this moment, seize it, live it, love it. Thank you so much for being with us. Michelle, I love you, my sister. 
I love you. This has been awesome. What an awesome experience. And thank you again to all of our faithful followers that have been cheering us on, because I tell you what, you've been, um, you've been energizing us more than you can even imagine. So look forward to seeing you next season. Yeah. And send us, uh, you know, the, the people that you think who are in senior position, trailblazing positions, who you think we should include too, because we need contacts. All right, people, thank you so much. Over and out for 2021. Thank you for joining the Hard Won Wisdom Podcast with best-selling author Fawn Germer and corporate innovator Michelle Brigman. Join us weekly for career and life-changing conversations with some of today's most influential thought leaders, senior executives, and trailblazers who will share their mentoring wisdom. This podcast is brought to you by the Women's Leadership Network. Visit hardwonwisdom.com for more on this podcast and for links to Fawn and Michelle's web pages and social media. Also, be sure to rate, subscribe, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. We really appreciate that effort, and we'll see you next week.